Christian College presents Bible Prophecy Lectures, Revelation Verse by Verse with Special Prophecy Topics. Main Teacher, Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan and Co-Teacher, Dr. Christine Joy Tan. Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary with a Master of Theology and at Grace Theological Seminary with a Doctor of Theology. A pastor, a seminary professor, and a Bible prophecy speaker for 50 years to over 500,000 people worldwide, he authored several popular books on prophecy and illustrations. Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan is a founding pastor and senior pastor emeritus of Grace Christian Church of the Philippines and the senior chaplain emeritus of Grace Christian College. He is a former director of Asian Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. Co-teaching with him is his beloved daughter, Dr. Christine Joy Tan. Dr. Christine Joy Tan has two earned PhD degrees from Dallas Theological Seminary in Bible Exposition and from the University of North Texas in Higher Education. Dr. Christine Joy Tan now serves as the president of Grace Christian College. She is also a Bible prophecy lecturer, a Christian educator, author of several journal articles, and editor of books. To date, Dr. Christine has led and co-led some 30 Bible land tours in the Middle East and Europe under the Paul Lee Tan Prophetic Ministries. I have the honor and the privilege to present to you Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Hi, everyone. Our topic today is A Visit to Heaven, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Sometimes we long to see heaven, even for an hour, or better, a whole day, a week, or forever. As Christians, we will get our wish when Jesus comes again. But let us be blessed today with what God reveals about heaven in these two chapters of Revelation 4 and 5. We study five major topics today. First, we see the Almighty God on the throne. Then, we attend two celestial worship services. First, worshiping God the Creator in chapter 4 and worshiping Christ the Redeemer in chapter 5. Actually, in chapter 5 is the coronation ceremony or the enthronement of Jesus, the ruler of the planet Earth. This will result in the entire Earth and the universe praising God. But first we need an invitation to enter heaven. And that is in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I look, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And he said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The very first two words after this refers, refer to the previous letters to the seven churches. After John had written and transmitted the letters of Christ to the seven churches, perhaps he was putting down his pen, and looking up to heaven, he exclaimed, Behold, he saw a door open in heaven with a voice, Come up hither. Actually, Revelation chapters 4 to 5 is a key to interpreting the entire book of Revelation. We are in heaven looking down. We are getting a heavenly perspective of all future earthly events. 
first three chapters deal with the church age, then four to five the rapture, six to eighteen the great tribulation, chapter nineteen hallelujah the second coming of Christ, chapter twenty the millennium on earth a thousand year reign of Christ, twenty b the great white throne judgment, and chapters twenty one and twenty two new heaven and new earth eternity. Wow! God wanted us first to get a vision of heaven, to reassure us that God is in control of all events on earth and in heaven. God is still on his throne. Now before we go further, let us note that John's going up to heaven here is a picture of the future rapture of the church. This is called the pre-tribulational rapture. We will study the rapture in a special session. But let us first read two verses about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the trump of God, and first the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is interesting to note that from chapters 1 to 3 of Revelation, the church is mentioned many times, the seven churches. But from chapter 4 onwards, we do not find any mention of the church on earth. This was simply because the rapture had already taken place in between. All Christians are now not on earth but in heaven. Of course, there would be tribulational saints during the tribulation who believe in Christ but they are not church age believers. Now let's go to the first topic of today's session, God on his throne. Chapter four, verses one to seven. Verse two, behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. The very first thing John saw was the throne, and one sitting on the throne. He is the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Now let us study the throne room of God in heaven. It is the central focus of heaven. It is the Holy of Holies in heaven. The first thing we see about this is in verse 3. And he, God the Father, that sat, was to look down upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. John could not even describe who God the Father looked like. Absolute deity was impossible to describe. He used, he just had to use the colors of two brilliant gems to describe God, jasper, is clear like crystal, like diamond, and sardine stone has the most perfect red color. Absolute purity and redemption are seen in God. Verse 6, in the midst of the throne, chapter 5, verse 6, stood a lamp as it had been slain. Now this is God the Son. Our next chapter 5 is devoted entirely to God, uh, the Son, who is Christ our Redeemer. The emphasis will be upon His atonement for our sins. Chapter 4 verse 5 says, God the Holy Spirit. There were seven lamps of the fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. There are not seven separate spirits in heaven. They are to be understood as the Holy Spirit. One person in the 
divine Godhead, and in His, the Holy Spirit's sevenfold character or manifestation, as presented in Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 6, And round about the throne were four beasts or living creatures. Now these four living creatures or beasts are the closest to God's throne. They are probably cherubims of the highest order, even above the archangels in rank. Their main function is mainly in leading heavenly worship of God. Verse 6b, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second like a calf, the third had the face of as a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. This is similar to the depiction of Christ in the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In other words, the living creatures, the four living creatures are Christ-centered. Let's go on. A, B, C. Number C. Round, verse 4. Round about the throne were 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Some people think these 24 elders are angels, but angels are never crowned in the Bible. We believe they represent Christians, Christians who were raptured into heaven and here now worshiping God in glory. They represent the 24 orders of priests, since we are kings and priests before God. Verse 11, D, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. We shall be meeting many angels in the book of Revelation, and they can help us as we pray directly to God, who will send his messengers, angels, to help. Following are some elements in heaven's throne room. First, verse 1 of chapter 4, Behold, a door was opened in heaven. Imagine in the last church of Laodicea, John the Apostle saw Christ knocking at a closed door. Now, Christ is inside the door in heaven, welcoming his people to enter. Verse 2, Behold, a throne was set in heaven. This is God's throne, and his ultimate triumph is certain. Number three, verse three, there was a rainbow round about the throne of God. Now the rainbow symbolizes God's faithfulness, mercy, and grace. God had made a covenant with Noah and mankind about not flooding the world again. Notice that here the heavenly rainbow is full, full circle, whereas on earth now it is half circle always. Also, the earthly rainbows always appear after the rain, but in heaven the rainbow appears all the time even before the rain on earth. Number four, verse six, and before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. In front of God's throne, there is a vast pavement of glass, shining brilliantly like sparkling crystal. That means whenever God's people approach the throne of grace in prayer, their heart would be filled with peace and quietness, like the crystal sea. Now we had mentioned earlier that we will be attending two celestial worship services today. The first worship would be to worship God as the Creator in chapter 4, and then 
to worship Christ as Redeemer in chapter 5. So we now come to the first worship of God as Creator of the world. And the first worship service is praising God the Creator by two groups. First group are the four living creatures in chapter 4 verses 89 and the second group by the 24 elders in verses 10 to 11. In chapter 4 verse 8, And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The four living creatures begin the oratorio of worship by focusing on God's holiness. Day and night, they say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, address to God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Now these four living creatures, or four beasts, give glory and honor and thanks, in verse 9, to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Wow! God living forever and ever is such a comfort and assurance to those persecuted Christians, even in the early church, as they went to martyrdom. To know that God is eternal provides comfort to His children. He will always be there to take care of them. God's eternity guarantees that our eternal life in heaven will never end. In 1 Corinthians Chronicles 17, 20, O Lord, there is none like Thee, nor is there any God beside Thee. True worship of God has to come from the heart. Since God, God is worth so much to us, we give Him the honor, glory, power, and praise. The second group, the 24 elders, in turn, are praising God now in verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Earlier, the praise of the four living creatures now triggers a response from the 24 elders. They fall down before God the Father and cast down their crowns before the throne. Verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Our English word worship really comes from the word worthy. So worship should really be written as worship with a TH in between. True worship ascribes worth or honor to one greater than we. The Bible text says, Thou hast created all things. The focus of the 24 elders in heaven is on God's glory in creation. The crescendo of praise exalts God the Father as the creator and sustainer of the universe. God has the right both to redeem and to judge His own creation. Now during a regular church service on earth, we may think that the chief actor is the pastor, and the prompter would be God, and the critic is the congregation. But true worship is, the chief actor is the congregation, the prompter is the pastor, and the critic is God. In my past 50 years as a pastor, in both Asia and America, I try to remind myself in my congregation about this. 
Now let's go on. We now come to chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamp. Worthy is the Lamp, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Now in world history, we see strong men who tried to rule over empires. Nebuchadnezzar the king, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler. And in the future, there will come the most powerful Satan-possessed world conqueror, the Antichrist. However, only one person, our Lord Jesus Christ, has the right, the power, the authority to rule the world, this earth. Christ will one day take back what is rightfully his from Satan the usurper. This will be shown in chapter 5 today of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Of course, 2,000 years ago books were not yet invented. This was technically a scroll sealed with seven seals and rolled up uh, into uh, a scroll type book. Now in John's day, a scroll was typically made of 8 by 10 inch sheets of papyrus, connected horizontally and then rolled up into a scroll. This book of Revelation of 22 chapters would require a scroll 15 feet long. It also was filled with writing on both sides. In other words, what was written was complete and final. Now, a scroll written on both sides, sealed with seven seals, is a very important document. This scroll is best viewed as the title deed or divine contract to a lost world, to a lost property. And the property is the planet Earth. Let us explain. Originally, God created the Earth, the planet Earth. The Earth is the choicest piece of property in the universe outside of heaven. God lovingly handcrafted it in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and called it very good. At the Garden of Eden, however, as God entrusted Adam to subdue the earth, Genesis 1, 28, Adam failed in that God-given responsibility. Adam ate the forbidden fruit and forfeited his right to ownership of planet earth. This transferred ownership to Satan, the title deed of our planet. Jesus in the New Testament referred to Satan as the prince of this world, John 12, 31. Now in Matthew chapter 4, Satan tempted Jesus, showing him all the kingdoms of the world, saying, All these things will I give to thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now Jesus did not dis dispute Satan on that point. But Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. So the earth was lost to Satan from Adam. But praise God, in Revelation chapter 5, we see that Jesus Christ was able to redeem planet earth back to its original rightful owner to himself. Christ did it by being the Lamb of God, dying for this sinful world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Verse 2 of chapter 5. And I saw a strong angel, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? 
Notice the angel did not say who is willing to take the book, because many earthly rulers would have been would have volunteered to take it. None in God's universe was worthy and able to pay the price to redeem the sinful world from Satan. It took the precious blood of the sinless Son of God to redeem sinful mankind. Verse 3. We are all in chapter 5 now. Verse 3. And no man in heaven or nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book. Think of it. Heaven searched high and low, wide and deep, long and hard, and found no one worthy to open the scroll. If God had emptied heaven with all its gold and precious stones, or if God should kill all the angels of heaven, it would still not be enough to pay the price to redeem the sinful world. Only Jesus could reclaim the world from the cosmic lost and found being that where it was stuck. But that would require sacrifice, the death of the sinless Son of God. Verse 4, And I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereupon. Now the Greek word translated weep much actually means to sob convulsively. Why was John weeping so hard? John was perhaps the most thoughtful of Jesus' twelve disciples. He was always closest to Jesus. He was the last one to remain at Jesus' cross, and he was one of the first at the empty tomb of Christ. Now, old John the Apostle was thoroughly versed in Christ and his doctrine. John immediately saw it. John knew that when no one is found worthy to take the book or scroll, this cursed earth is consigned forever to Satan and death. So he started weeping in despair. But he was comforted soon by an elder, one of the twenty-four, who introduced someone who could fix everything. Verse 5, And one of the elders said unto him, unto me. John was writing it. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now to understand the meaning of why the elder told John not to cry, we must study the meaning of the kinsman redeemer principle. In the Hebrew Bible and the rabbinical tradition, a kinsman redeemer is a person who, as the nearest relative, is charged with restoring a relative's rights. One duty of the kinsman redeemer was to redeem or buy back a relative who had been sold into slavery. However, the kinsman redeemer must satisfy three basic requirements. First, he must be related or be next of kin. Secondly, he must be able to pay the redemption price. Thirdly, he must be willing to do so. Jesus Christ proved to be the only one in the universe who is worthy to redeem planet Earth. Here are three reasons three reasons. Number one, Christ was related to mankind. Jesus was born into humanity and was the son of man. The elder mentioned that Jesus was from the root of David on his mother Mary's side. Secondly, Jesus was 
able to pay redemption's price. He was the eternal Son of God. His precious blood and death on the cross fully paid for the redemption of this earth. The elder also cited the Lion of Judah. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. That tribe had produced Israel's line of kings. And thirdly, Christ was willing to die for us. He was the sinless one who willingly went to the cross to redeem sinful mankind. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb, as it had been slain. Maybe John was looking for a lion, as the elder had just told him about the lion of Judah. But he saw a lamb instead, and even a wounded lamb. Christ received his kingdom, not by force and power, but by suffering and dying as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 6b, the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth, sent forth into all the world. The lamb has seven horns, which means he is a roaring lamb. It has seven eyes, which means he is a reigning lamp. He reigns in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. During the Great Tribulation, God's Holy Spirit will be sent forth into all the earth by God, the triune God, and multitudes will be saved from all nations, kindred, tongues, and peoples in Revelation chapter 7. Let's go on in verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Wow, this is one of the most important events of all time. The Lamb of God reaches forth his nail-scarred hand to receive the scroll from the Eternal Father. In that one incredible moment, the love of the Heavenly Father meets the love of His only begotten Son. Christ's death is the only atonement for sins that God the Father would accept. God is only satisfied with the blood atonement of Christ Jesus, His Son, on the cross. Imagine, it was only about 50 years ago when the young disciple John saw Jesus dying on the cross. He was the last one at the cross of his disciples. Now, the old disciple John in heaven is attending the coronation ceremony of Christ, the victorious Redeemer of the universe. God allowed the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, to see it all within his lifetime on earth. John saw Jesus, the sovereign Savior, becoming Christ, the enthroned Redeemer of earth, because he was the Son of God. The scroll is now received and the triumph is secured. The Lamb of God now holds and forever holds the title deed to the universe. Hallelujah, the Son of God. This will start the millennium and the new heaven and the new earth. However, first, there would have to be seven years of cleansing and judgment of the great tribulation on earth. Jesus has established his worthliness to redeem the world back from Satan the usurper. Now it is time to celebrate 
to worship. Let worship begin. Chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. This will be worship service number two in heaven for us. Actually, it will be more than a regular worship in heaven. It will be the coronation or the enthronement ceremony of Jesus Christ as King of planet Earth. The program is all praise and singing as follows. First, the four living creatures and 24 elders would announce Christ's death for mankind. Secondly, billions and billions of angels would declare him worthy of glory. Thirdly, every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea, would bless both God the Creator and Christ the Redeemer forever. Imagine right after we are raptured to heaven. It would really be a very short time to the start of the 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus on earth. Just about seven short years of the tribulation. After the rapture, the earth will have to undergo seven years judgment of the great tribulation. And then Jesus and we will come down to earth to reign 1,000 years and then follows eternity in the new heaven and new earth. Everything will run in super fast fashion as the earth now has a righteous ruler. Jesus redeems his people from Satan and hell. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus at the rapture. Verses 9 and 10, we have the first coronation song. Verses 9 and 10 writes, And they, the four beasts and twenty-four elders, sang a new song, saying, One, thou art wor worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For, two, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. 3. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. 4. And has redeemed us unto our God as kings and priests. 5. And we shall reign on the earth. Wow, this is a new song for it tells the full story of Christ's redemption. It is a worship song. It says, Thou art worthy. It is a gospel song. It says, Thou was slain and Redeem us by thy blood. It's a, it's a missionary song. It points to every kindred, tongue, people, and nations. It is a devotional hymn. It affirms that Christ has made us kings and priests to God. And it is a prophetic hymn. It teaches, we shall reign on the earth. Brothers and sisters, friends, why is Jesus not coming? to earth sooner. It could be that Jesus wanted every people group on earth to be saved and to be forever represented in heaven. Are we doing our part in hastening his return? And to think of it, if only our worship on earth now could blend all this spiritual emphasis that would really be true worship. Verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard, the voice of many angels. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. How many angels are in God's universe? It says here in this verse, 10,000 times 10,000, which is, 100 million. Then, 100 million times thousands and thousands, that would be billions and billions of angels. And so, at the end of 
earthly time. Billions and billions of angels, both angels and saints, would sing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Now, angels did not experience salvation themselves, but they would be so happy for us who are redeemed by Jesus Christ. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. The angels gave a sevenfold blessing to Christ. May honor, glory, and blessing be to the Lamb who was slain. And now, verse 13. Every creature in the universe, which is in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and in the sea, all that are in them. Heaven, you know, we all know, is already filled with joy. It is normal to be joyful in heaven. And yet, when the Lamb of God takes the scroll from the Father's hand, heaven is literally exploding with extreme joy and music. Verse 13 continues, And I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. This magnificent coronation service is now at its climax. All of God's universe, praising the Lamb of God and the Father seated on the throne. It is like a party on earth that wakes up the neighbors. The celebration in heaven would go on forever. About 30 years ago, I was teaching a Revelation class, and I made a little PowerPoint slide to celebrate Christ's coming reign on earth with the students, using these four wonderful words of blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Creation can now be set free from the bondage of sin and death. God's great eternal plan could now be fulfilled. Jesus had said, Behold, I come quickly. And John's answer is, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, 20. Verse 14 of chapter 5, And the four beasts, or living creatures, said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. What a picture. The four living creatures saying, Amen and Amen. And the four elders worshipping him again and again forever. The Lamb now holds the title deed to planet Earth and the universe in his nail-scarred hands. He now stands ready to open the seven seals of the Great Tribulation to pronounce the judgment in Revelation 6, culminating in his righteous kingdom on earth in Revelation 19 and 20 and all the way to 22. Soon and very soon, this mighty host of heaven's saints and angels would march out of heaven with Jesus. We shall return with Jesus to set up his 1,000 year kingdom on earth as presented in Revelation 19 to 20. Get ready, the state is all set. Amen. As we share in these heavenly worship services. Do you find in your own heart saying Amen also? You may believe in Christ as the Creator, 
But have you trusted him as your Redeemer? If yes, we thank God for you. But if not, will you do so right now? Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This picture shows mankind on the left mountaintop, on the left side. Mankind has invented many good things, education, philosophy, science, even religion and good works. These are good for this life, but inadequate, totally no use for eternal life. There is no other way to redeem mankind from the grip of sin and Satan. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. There is no other way to God. Only Jesus, the Redeemer, can save you and me. Pray that you will accept Jesus into your heart and be safe. So we all bow in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for thy word, which brings life and light to our heart. Thank you for thy Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this world and redeemed us from Satan and death and sin. As a result, we can live the Christian life with joy, peace, and hope, and with eternity in view. Bless each of us, Lord, today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.